forward and we'll share our screen and we will jump back into Mark chapter 15 with the burial of Jesus. All right. Good morning, Chris. When, well, just to do a quick recap of where we're coming. Um, so we talked a little bit about how in our mind and our devotional setting, so the way in which we engage with the Bible devotionally, either in our own spiritual practices or in corporate worship, we conflate the stories of Jesus' crucifixion together so that all of the disparate elements of the four gospels kind of are one narrative in our minds. We do the same thing with the nativity story where only one gospel has the magi, one gospel has the shepherd, and one gospel, the angel appears to Joseph and another the angel appears to Mary. So we put all that together into one story. And so when we think of the seven last words of Jesus, we're picking those up from all four gospels and putting them into one. Here in the gospel of Mark, we have the cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A quotation from Psalm 22, Everyone would have memorized the Psalms, and so they would have known what Jesus was referring to when he said that. And then we have here the prophecy, again, of Elijah, who so often was thought of as the one who was going to come back, perhaps as a forerunner to the Messiah, or in some way to bring the people closer to God. And so that is still in play. People are still wondering the identity of Jesus, somehow he may be able to call on Elijah. They think that's what he's doing when he cries out to God. And then we have this grand declaration from the centurion, which is going to be picked up by early Christian writers as this instance of a Gentile or someone not affiliated with the Jewish community recognizing the identity of Jesus. This was God's son. We talked about the temple being torn in two. That took a lot of our focus last week and just thinking about how that could have happened and what the symbolism is. Of course, this idea of the access we have to the inner sanctum of the temple through Jesus. And so this scene uh, was going to be written about a lot in the early Christian community, trying to differentiate, you know, what's changing about the ways in which we follow Jesus that may be different from Jewish practice. One of which is the idea that we have direct access to God, no intermediaries. And that's going to be true as well of when we think about different religious practices within Catholicism that we um, in the Protestant churches don't pray to other saints or we don't pray to the dead because we believe we don't need an intermediary to access God. So, okay. Just a little recap, and, and then we get into the burial of Jesus, chapter 15, verse 42. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, this would have been the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. Okay, so Joseph of Arimathea, uh, we see him in other parts of the gospel um, and in the gospel stories, but here he is, one of the council who wants to bury Jesus to give him a proper burial. Pilate wonders if he's already dead, probably because he wants to make sure that he's not going to be fooled by some sort of a trick to where he's not dead. They take him and they bury him, but he, he comes back to life. And then they have the same problem all over again, where this king of the Jews is trying to claim that he has resurrected from the dead. And so there was a, a, a desire to make sure that he was actually dead. And so he asked the centurion whether he was dead or not. Um, that is going to be an accusation waged against the early Christians, that they had this whole ruse where they were the ones who buried Jesus, and they told this resurrection story, but Jesus never actually died. And so that's why 
they put into this part of the gospel that Pilate confirmed that he was dead. Verse 47, Joseph of Arimathea is the one who buried the body, but then we have two witnesses. You always have to have two witnesses, but these witnesses are female. We're going to get into that once we transition to 16 uh, in the next passage, but the ground has laid that we have female witnesses to the resurrection. Questions, comments, thoughts on this passage? Okay. Let me, yeah, go ahead, Carol Lee. What does it mean that Joseph himself was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God? Yeah. So we get these dialogues between Jesus and particular members of the council. Joseph of Arimathea and John, the famous conversation is going to be with a man named Nicodemus, where he says, you have to be born again. And he's confused because he doesn't know how you can get back into your mother's womb. And so there were Jewish people who had this idea that the kingdom of God was coming again, that a Messiah was coming. There was different understandings of what exactly that would look like. And so it's saying, you know, Joseph was someone who thought that a Messiah was coming, that the kingdom of God was going to be established, and he thinks perhaps it might be Jesus. You know, we get this tidbit that he's a respected member of the council, so this isn't just fishermen. We have centurions, we have respected members of the council who are also following the way of Jesus. All right. Chapter 16. So Mark chapter 16 is one of my favorite chapters in all of scripture. And I think is a very important resurrection account. Um, and so I love preaching on this on Easter. Um, you know, every couple of years, because I think it is so different than what we expect from the Easter story. So let's begin chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. Um, in the sermon today, we're going to get into the first appearance of Gabriel during the nativity story. And every single time the angels come on the scene, that that's their refrain. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Here it's do not be alarmed. Just translation. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Okay. It's not the end of the gospel as we have it in our scriptures. But a Bible like the NRSV is going to have certain notations. And so we're going to get the intermediate ending of Mark with these brackets around it. We're gonna get the long ending of Mark with additional brackets over it because our earliest manuscripts end after verse eight. And that's what I love about this gospel. There's not a whole series of resurrection stories. It just ends with a fear and amazement, and they tell nothing to no one, for they were afraid, and it leaves it at that. The gospel started with, this is the story of Jesus the Christ, and we are given all of this evidence, this person who's able to forgive sins and heal on the Sabbath, who's able to do this holistic transformation of people, both bodily and spiritually, and Peter declares, this is the Messiah, and we're asked, do we believe that is true or not? And we come to the end, we're told Jesus has raised from the dead. No one has said anything yet. If no one said anything, how do you know? What do you believe? I think the gospel ends here as an invitation for us to continue to write 
the ending of Mark chapter 16 with our own lives, with our own faith, with our own beliefs. But that wasn't good enough for a lot of early Christians. Again, they're thinking, you know, we've asked, how are we able to know the inner dialogue of Jesus or if he's alone in the Garden of Gethsemane who wrote this down? And if the people who witnessed the resurrection said nothing to anyone, then how do we even know that Jesus came back from the dead? And so as a result of that, we see early manuscripts don't include it. And then we see marginal notations of people saying, this is strange, something must be missing. And then they start writing in the margins additional stories. And then those stories eventually become part of the actual manuscripts themselves, what were once marginal notations. And that's when we get the rest of what is the gospel of Mark chapter 16. But in our earliest manuscripts, this is where it ends. So we'll talk more about that theme, but just the, the details of these verses. Questions, thoughts, comments? Interesting to complete your story and put it in there. Yeah, you think it's a cleaner ending. I, I do think it's a really, um, I do think it's a really, it's an abrupt ending. Clean, I like that too. Um, Jesus is resurrected. That's the message. Yeah. Think about the history of Christianity. Um, there's all sorts of things depicted later in this gospel that we don't exclusively find useful anymore. Right, and so forth. Yeah. Um, so, what is the writer talking about what happened? If you were, were taking care of problems, but they want to make sure that people knew that that wasn't the magic trick that, that, that you proved. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So Doug says, you know, another concern for the writers is just thinking about doubts surrounding this story and wanting to ensure people that this wasn't just a magic trick, because that was an occupation uh, for people in ancient Palestine was the role of magician. And so they would do magic tricks. They would claim something like I can raise someone from the dead. And so they're working against that sort of skepticism of is this some, is this just a magician or is God doing something greater, grander, or more authentic. Yeah, great comment, Doug. Yeah, Kevin. Um, a couple things about verse seven. I never like um, being able to see disciples in like everyday people, but but I'm also wondering that I probably just forgotten this. Like when it says he is going to send you to Galilee, does that mean that the disciples were on the way to Galilee? Or like Jesus is there and we should be there. And it also kind of suggests that it's not dependent on our strength to be quite skilled, you know. Ah. Yeah, I love that. Um, Rick, you said in King James Version, there's more to this chapter up to verse 20. Yes. Um, I'm curious if the King James Bible you have um, has any notation that verses 9 through 20 are later addendums. Um, so if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat. And then Kevin asked two questions. Um, first, verse seven says, tell his disciples and Peter, why is Peter bracketed outside of the disciples? And secondly, um, when it says, go ahead to Galilee, are the disciples already there? At the very least, it shows that this isn't Jesus just kind of hanging on by a thread. It's not, he never died and he's got the spear wound and he's still bleeding and he's bandaged up and somehow he's going to get to Galilee. Um, I think that's a really important thing to look at. So first with uh, tell his disciples and Peter. So we've seen throughout this gospel, the other gospels emphasize it too, that of course, Peter is the head of the disciples, if there is a head or the, the one who is most singled out. And I wonder too, if it's tied to his role with this whole denial story. So tell the disciples and, and make sure you tell Peter, um, who's probably beating himself up who needs to be reminded that I'm still alive, just as I said. Um, and so that's just my, my guesses here, um, that Peter's the, the unique disciple. And we, we need this redemption story that we're going to get in the Gospel of John. So um, the Gospel of Matthew is going to emphasize this go ahead of you to Galilee um, even more. 
and they are going to meet in Galilee. And that's where the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is going to take place is in Galilee. So supposedly, because multiple gospels pick up on this, there had been some instruction that in his death predictions, when I come back from the dead, just as I said, you know, meet me in Galilee. So several of the gospels emphasize that there had been previous instructions to go to Galilee, but we find the disciples not doing that because they remain in Jerusalem in a locked room. And, and so in another gospel, Jesus is going to appear to him, to them in that locked room with the story of doubting Thomas. He's not there. And so he comes back later. Um, but Mark and Matthew both emphasize that the encounter with Jesus does happen in Galilee um, as predicted. And I like what you said. Um, two weeks ago during my sermon, I mentioned the work of Anna Carter Florence. She's a really great scholar and preacher and kind of her shtick, if you will, is she always analyzes the verbs of a passage. She wants to understand what a passage means by what verbs are being chosen. And um, there are very active verbs that we get in the resurrection story um, about Jesus, that Jesus is always going, doing, um, very active. And so I, I like that you picked up on that. So we're going to tell his disciples, he's going ahead of you. He's on the move. If you can sit and wallow and worry about what's happened and feel sorry for yourselves. Um, but while you're doing that, Jesus has already gone ahead of you to Galilee. He's moving. If you want to be part of this great movement, then jump aboard because Jesus is already on the move. So I really like that. Uh, Rick says it's not clear in my 63 year old Bible. Um, you know, not surprising, Rick, um, that older Bibles, King James Version, wouldn't have those notations. It's definitely become um, something much more common. Um, some of the academic translations, uh, so that NRSV was originally the RSV, Revised Standard Version. So they were doing it um, in the mid 20th century. And even what might cons be considered more like devotional evangelical translations, they're now adding these notations because it's... You know, instead of hiding that from the common Bible reader for fear of um, maybe this Bible isn't infallible if there are adding endings. Um, I think it's so well accepted that the original ending ended at, at, at verse eight that even more devotional evangelical Bibles now have this, these notations. Yeah, Doug. Uh, the fact that he told them to go to Galilee, Central, left in the middle of nowhere, and yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Great observation. And that's been a theme throughout the gospel story here. So Doug says it's crucial that he's going ahead of them to Galilee, because if you were planning a resurrection to prove to the world the truth of your faith, you would do it in the middle of the temple courtyard. You would do it uh, in Roman Palatine. You would do it somewhere where it would create this great stir and this great revival. Uh, but Jesus says, go to Galilee. Go to this really backwoods area um, where nothing really happens. It's full of Jewish workers. But that's where the resurrected Christ will be. Um, Oh, we get that. That's just such an important part of the gospel message that the message of God does not just come to the circles of power. It does. It will. Um, I think that's an important part of knowing the occupations of the prophets. We have institutional prophets like Isaiah, uh, but we also have poor farmers like Amos. Um, so, you know, Pilate's going to be part of the story, but also someone like Peter and James and John and Andrew. And so that's, that's, that's really important. So great observation. Um, but that is also where he will be accepted. Yeah. Um, that's going to be, that's going to be at play throughout uh, the Christian faith. And of course, come to a head with Constantine first making Christianity a religion that could be practiced. And then for it kind of transition into the main religion of the Roman Empire, was that good? Well, it certainly prevented Christianity from dying out, um, but then it's co-opted by the empire. It's used by people in power. 
So this is this is at play today. Like these are discussions that we have today. What is the role of faith and power? All right. Other comments, thoughts, Chris? The yeah, they do. Um, and so you know we have we have copies of all of these things. Um, so I could not quote to you an exact date right now. Um, if I were to guess just from memory, you know, we're talking, um, you know, medieval times, maybe early, maybe 800s. So much later. Yeah. So don't quote me on that. Um, but they, they do have an understanding of about when these notations are happening. Uh, Ron? Going back to 1412, and you start with the use of the unleavened bread. It's mandated back in Exodus. Seven day reduction. I guess I'm getting confused a little bit with the time frame here between, you know, you know start there, last supper, and then crucifixion and resurrection. This all ties into that feast of resurrection. Yeah, so Ron's question is just kind of confused on the timing of when the Passover is happening versus when the resurrection is taking place. And so we mentioned before the discrepancy in the Gospels. John makes the Passover feast the night of his death so that he is the Passover lamb. And these is happening, the crucifixion. Um, it's happening the, the morning after, so they've already celebrated the Passover feast before. And so what's happening here is kind of the Passover is then bleeding into the Sabbath. And the reason the timing there is important is because people would have not been doing anything on the Sabbath. And so that kind of gives us time for that three-day window um, so that, you know, Sabbath is sundown to sundown. And so it's sundown on one day to sundown on the next day. And so then they're going early in the morning afterwards. So that's how we get the three days. Um, so it's the day where the Sabbath starts to the day where the Sabbath ends to the next morning is the third day. Um, so what's important here in terms of emphasis is not necessarily Passover, but more so Sabbath. Um, so we would have been one, two, so the Passover meal would have taken place the night before the day, the Passover, the Sabbath begins at night. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. If you have the Passover, you have to totally consume the lamb. If we're taking Jesus as the lamb of God, then we have to totally consume Jesus and his sacrifice. Yeah. For everybody, no matter what, or yeah. 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 I like that. So, Ron's, you know, emphasizing that um, this idea of the Passover lamb being completely consumed or Jesus being completely consumed. And that's not something they're thinking about in the moment. Like, they don't have this clear understanding of Jesus is the Passover lamb. So, that's going to be picked up by. Christian writers after the fact, um, but everything you're saying is spot on. Like people have written about this and, and, and emphasized what role the concept of the Passover played in Jesus's resurrection, death and resurrection. So that's really good. Um, Jackie, are unmarried women allowed to anoint bodies? Huh, good question. I don't know. Um, yeah, I do not know. So, you know, corollary to that question um, is, does that mean these women were all married if they are anointing them or are they going against custom? I don't know. Good question though. Does it make any difference to us whether or not Jesus was literally raised from the dead? Great question, Jerry. Um, so the early Christians, Paul, would answer that question, absolutely. Paul's discussion of resurrection in Corinthians emphasizes that the Christian faith 
means nothing if we don't have a literal resurrection, that he believes strongly in the literal resurrection. And so therefore, um, it is through that resurrection that we too are resurrected. And if that didn't actually happen, if this is just following an interesting person with great teachings, then Paul felt like his life was a waste. Um, I personally have what is called a very high Christology, Christology being, you know, what is the concept of Jesus or the Christ? And so my Christology is really high in terms of, you know, I believe in a literal resurrection. Um, and it is through that resurrection that the um, resurrection of all of us is affected, that we are all redeemed through Christ's death and resurrection. So that's what I believe. Um, on my, on my vocational days where I'm like wondering to myself, what if none of this is true? Does it still matter what I'm doing? And the answer I come to on like Paul is absolutely like, I, I do think that what we do as people of faith matters. Um, it matters for the, the billions of people who follow this to help lead them into making the world a better place, no matter what. And I think Jesus's declaration that the kingdom of God is already among us emphasizes to us how important our actions are in this world as we try to make earth into God's heavenly kingdom. So if there wasn't a little resurrection, I still think what we are doing matters. Uh, but I personally do believe there was a little resurrection. And I think it's important theologically um, for my understanding of what happens to us after death for resurrection, for the way God redeems humanity. So um, that's a great question, Jerry. And I saw um, this morning that you had emailed me this week. And um, I think that's a really great question. I would love to hear your thoughts too, if you want to share them by email. But um, there are people of faith that I respect on all sides of this spectrum. Um, but I think there is substance and weight to a literal resurrection. Um, other questions, thoughts? Well, yeah. If there wasn't, I think the early, well, we would have had like the early church that we had, and that history, I mean, it was just for another man dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Jennifer kind of emphasizing if this man had died, then it would just be another dead man. Um, I think that's a, a really perfectly logical argument that a lot of people make that I, I think carries weight that we've had many people come to earth with followers who have good teaching that are worthwhile to learn. Um, but the Christian faith is staked in a claim that there's something different about Jesus, that he's not just a great teacher, that this is the son of God, the Messiah, who has come to redeem humanity so that death is not the end of our story, that there's something greater happening cosmically. Um, and so all the other great rulers and teachers, you know, this is the, this is the point of um, Ecclesiastes, that this wise teacher says, everyone succumbs to death at some point, so that even the king and the peasant are both eaten by the same worm. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's something different about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jordan? I thought about this a lot. And I think that what I think about this is that the Lord I believe that you can make a convincing historical argument that Jesus was resurrected. But then at the same time, I think, like, it's, it's, like it's, it's conceivable that Jesus wasn't killed by crucifixion, that they that it was you know, a parent death, and he still wasn't dead. Like, is that any less of a miracle? Because I think uh, miracles like uh, crossing the Red Sea. Like the Red Sea kind of causes or parts today to go there. Like the Israelites could have crossed what they call the Sea of Reeds, mm -hmm. very shallow, uh, very 
very shallow sea. And I think, you know, is that any less of a miracle that they were able to do that? Yeah. So, mm. like, ultimately, I'm convinced, like, I believe that Jesus was resurrected. But then I think, you know, there's people who don't think that. And I think, you know, it could still be a miracle. Mm. I really like that reframing, Jordan. So Jordan says, you know, he personally believes in resurrection, but wonders that if it didn't happen exactly the way the gospels communicated, if Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, and then thinking of other miracles like the crossing of the Red Sea, um, you know, the, the documents we have of this crossing, as Jordan point out, refer to it as the Sea of Reeds which would have been a place much shallower, easier to cross. Um, you know, the historical documentation we have of that story is that while scripture claims it's in the hundreds of thousands of people, it was probably tens of thousands of people. So there are, but the, the question you raise or the reframing is, is it any less of a miracle? I really like that. I think we need to think of miracles as um, not just times in which the laws of physics or the universe are suspended, but times in which something extraordinary and meaningful happen, where we can open our eyes up to kind of everyday miracles. And so even if it doesn't happen exactly this way, is it not still miraculous that someone would be willing to die for humanity or someone would preach a message in which all people are included? Yeah, I think that is just as miraculous. Um, you use the word, what if you just seem to die? Um, that phrase would have branded you a, a heretic in early Christian circles um, as a docetist. So there were people who said Jesus only seemed to die from the Greek word uh, to seem or to appear. And so that was a big debate and quickly branded as heresy. It, it wasn't just that he seemed to die. He actually died. He actually suffered. Um, but that's not what you were trying to say. I think that whole idea of, is it, is it not still miraculous no matter how it, it shook out? Yeah, absolutely. Doug? Nevertheless, more, always more important with you and I to today is resurrection and what happened 2,000 years ago. Mm. And it's just crazy when you think of the whole homecoming happened then in some way that takes us out of it. Yeah. So Doug said it's you know even more important what we do today than what exactly happened 2,000 years ago. You said it's an escapism to just be thinking about ancient history. And I think in our faith, there's also escapism when we think only about future resurrection as well. Um, living in the present, what we do now matters just as much. Very well said. Saw another hand up. No? Um, really great, great question, Jerry. Um, and I think that ties into what you were saying, Doug, that no matter what, the ways in which we act now, the ways in which we're bringing God's kingdom to pass now, the ways in which we act like Joseph of Arimathea and think about the, the coming of the kingdom of God, that matters now. Um, but there is, I believe, theological importance to the concept of resurrection. All right, any other questions or thoughts on this passage? Okay. Let's delve into the rest of Mark 16. So our intermediate ending. Um, and all that they had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. So it just answers the question. How did anyone else know if they didn't say anything? Well, they did tell Peter. Um, and afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Amen. I mean, that just reads as a marginal note, right? Uh, well, actually they did and, and everything, they sent them out and they proclaimed salvation. Amen. Um, it's totally a different tone than the first one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, when, when we get into discussions of, um, anyone watch Jeopardy? This is an aside. Uh, did you see the controversy of maybe a week and a half ago? Um, the final Jeopardy question, the category was New Testament. And the question was, um, 
this epistle by the Apostle Paul has the most references to the Old Testament? Um, and the answer was Hebrews. But no one today believes that Paul wrote Hebrews. And so everyone was up in arms that they would put that in the question. Um, <laughs> um, and so there are letters of Paul um, that most scholars today would think that Paul didn't write them. And the reason being the language is different. The tone is different. It uses words not found in, in the other letters of Paul. Um, and so you're spot on. The tone is different. If we were to you know, do a language study, probably the vocabulary is different, even in just a small sample size, especially something like sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. We haven't seen that anywhere in the gospel. Any comments on this one? Okay. All right, we're going to get into... Uh, long ending. Um, now, after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Um, another aside, if you enjoy poetry, Marie Howe, M-A-R-I-E, Howe, H-O-W-E, has a poem on Mary Magdalene that just thinks about what those seven demons were. And I find it one of the most gorgeous poems I've ever read. So look that up later today, Marie Howe, H-O-W-E, Mary Magdalene. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. But when they heard that he was alive and had been sent by her, they would not believe it. So this is not unusual for them not to believe the women. Um, in another gospel, John and Peter are going to run after them and visit the tomb for themselves. They want to put eyes on it themselves. So um, Mary Magdalene uh, goes out and tells them while they're mourning, but they don't believe her. So then we need another appearance so that someone else can see it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Later, he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were sitting at the table. And he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Okay, we're getting weird now. Um, there were early Christian communities that practiced this sort of spiritual showboatery, magicness um, to say like, clearly we are the right faith or look at these grand acts that we can do and not die. God is on our side saving us. And so there are religious communities to this day, Appalachian snake candlers. Um, so you'll find rural communities that practice snake handling on a regular basis. Um, so let's just back up a second here. Um, what we're getting in this long ending are other resurrection accounts that have kind of been conflated to this one. So there are a lot of parallels with the other gospels and the stories they're telling especially this idea of Jesus appearing to the 11 or in the gospel of Luke, we have the road to Emmaus where two people are walking and Jesus appears to them. So these gospel writers or these marginal writers know these other stories from the gospels and they're just kind of taking them and putting them into here too. Well, this should be added to Mark. We know this happened because we know it from the other gospels. So it should be part of this gospel as well. Um, but then we get this, this really weird element where, um, you know, these practices of marginal Christian communities are now incorporated into the Gospels. Thoughts or questions here?
Okay. Well, let's jump into the ascension. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and proclaimed the good news everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that accompanied it. So, you know, Chris, picking up on what you said, tone here sounds different, language sounds different. Um, I mean, you, you get exactly what these marginal notes are trying to accomplish. Um, it couldn't have ended with the women running from the tomb. I think the author intended for that because it really is an invitation for us to think about Jesus' identity for ourselves. But they added on some of the other resurrection accounts from the other gospels. And they want us to know that people did go out and proclaim the gospel. Um, and with that, there were miracles accompanying their stories. So we're basically getting into Acts. And so the gospel writer of Luke is going to have the story of Jesus and then accompany it with the story of the first apostles. Um, and that's why it's kind of a two-part story. The ascension of Jesus happens both at the end of the gospel and then we pick up on it again in Acts chapter one. And so the ascension is just saying, Jesus goes back into heaven and we continue proclaiming the good news. It's not just Jesus's role anymore, but we are the teachers of the gospel. Okay, that brings us to, that is the last part of, of, of Mark, and that brings us to the end of our time here. And so um, what I'm thinking is, um, for those who can make it next week, I would love to kind of have just a, a debriefing, more of a devotional discussion of some elements of the gospel of Mark, bring it to a close, feel like we ended our time with Mark well. Um, and next week, come with some ideas or thoughts of where you might want to go next. Um, and then for the rest of Advent and um, Sunday, we have a Christmas Day Sunday and a New Year's Day Sunday. So we'll take a break after next week, and then we'll pick it up on the second week of January with a new book. Um, so let's go ahead and meet next week and just kind of bring Mark to a close, ask some overarching questions, and make a plan for what's next. Does that sound good? All right. Um, well, let me close in prayer for us. Um, God, thank you for these, these great questions and time to sit with your gospel. We pray that this can continue to be an invitation for us to be writing what's next in the story of God, that we can be part of this great proclamation of good news, and that we can confirm it by signs, not just through miraculous physical healings, but as Jordan said, through Miracles that happen all the time, every day, in the ways in which we support and love each other in this world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you in worship. Hey, Malachi. Hey, Linda. Lynn, Jerry, James, Rick. Good group. Hey, Bob. Have a good day, everyone.